Long-tail macaques are largely found in Southeast Asia, from Burma to the Philippines and Indonesia in the south. But how did a small population reach the isolated, deep water oceanic islands of Nicobar? Some scientists believe that thousands of years ago, they may have got trapped in a large raft of floating vegetation that eventually hit the island. Others believe that human beings introduced them. Eventually, left alone in a string of plentiful islands with virtually no predators, they evolved into a unique subspecies. Found only on three Nicobar Islands and nowhere else in the world, the population has been declared as vulnerable. Like most primate species, these macaques are intelligent, adaptable and extremely social. Scientists have noticed that they are adept at using tools and extremely skilled at finding food. Not only use, they manufacture also the tool. They use leaves and break leaves from the small saplings and they use it to wipe out sap or the dart from fruits. Then they process the fruit. And not only in the context of food, they also use this tool for hygiene purpose, which is very unique. They use this feather or grass blade to clean faces from in between their teeth. It is a teeth flossing, a hygiene purpose use. For hundreds of years, the local pandanus fruit has been one of their favorite foods. But the Nicobar monkeys have mastered another skill that most other species haven't, opening a green coconut. Though coconut is available in the all habitat where these 10 subspecies are living, but Nicobar long-tail macaque is the only macaque who eats coconut. And coconut is the significant amount in their diet. But not many plantation owners of Campbell Bay are happy with the company. Campbell Bay is the only town in the Great Nicobar Island. It supports a small population of about 5,000 people. 80% of the island is demarcated as a forest reserve. Life here is isolated from the mainland, except for an erratic once-a-week ship service. In 1969, the mainlanders, particularly ex-army men and their families, were settled here as part of a union government-sponsored rehabilitation scheme. The mainlanders were given large tracts of farmlands worked on by migrant labourers, like Suraj and his family, who encounter the macaques every day. <laughs> However, not everyone feels this way. Some new settlers are more understanding. The street dogs too are largely used to having them around. Once humans moved into the islands, the clashes were almost immediate. But over the years, they've escalated. The 2004 tsunami that ravaged the island didn't help matters. Three gigantic waves slammed into the coastal habitat. 
monkeys and humans lost lives and homes. With support from the government, people started slowly getting their lives together again after the tsunami. Unfortunately, the macaques lost out during this rehabilitation. Coastal forests around Campbell Bay that once had thriving pandanus groves were cleared to accommodate human settlements. The territorial troops suddenly found themselves amidst people and farms. With these settlements came garbage and easy access to food. Forced to live in such proximity to humans, the macaques learned to adapt. Their poorly hit population recovered soon. Coconut farms soon became their favourite feeding and resting grounds. Their presence enraged the farmers. And the playful macaques that came in large groups soon became the most visible enemy. As both populations gained strength, the monkeys and humans of Nicobar found themselves at odds with each other. There may be many theories of how the long-tailed macaques reached the Nicobar Islands. But today, Nicobar is the only home they have known, adapted to and survived in against all odds. Conservation initiatives that work with local communities are the only hope to mitigate the complex post-tsunami reality of the Nicobar Islands and ensure that the Nicobar long-tailed macaques continue to survive in their only home.